morning once again, everyone. Welcome to uh, uh, our Sunday school. I hope you enjoy the service this morning. Uh, this is the first time that we'll be gathering together, but uh, we are having our Sunday school uh, still uh, stream uh, online. So welcome, and welcome to our new series of lesson. Uh, last Sunday was the last installment of our previous lesson regarding uh, spiritual gifts. Today we'll be starting with uh, a new lesson uh, with the short uh, episodes in the New Testament. Uh, if you know, uh, there's a, a couple of um, episodes or letters in the New Testament which are very short. In fact, uh, in the original uh, Greek letters of these uh, books, we see that uh, they are only uh, written in one papyri. So today we'll be starting with the uh, second John, the second episode of the Apostle John. In fact, the title of our lesson for today is The Truth and the Believers. Please turn your Bible to second John and we'll be, we'll be reading from verses 1 to 4. And it says there, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, and mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, once again, we are so thankful for you having gathering us together to study your word. Help us as we go through these verses that that will give us understanding and enlightenment. And may we apply this in our everyday life, the principles that we'll be learning today. Thank you and uh, bless uh, bless our time together in Christ's name. We pray, Amen. So, as I've mentioned today, we will be beginning our lesson with the second episode of John. As you know, John is uh, the what we know as the beloved apostle who wrote the Gospel of John, First John, Second, Third John, and Revelation. Now, Second John is a very short. Uh, letter. In fact, uh, if we will, uh, comparing it in today's uh, communication, this second John can be considered as a postcard. So, we're starting with verse 1. The title of our lesson for today is The Truth and the Believers. Now, nowadays, uh, a lot of things is happening in our society. In fact, we all are in, uh, in some way or another are bothered by them. Why? Because there is an attack in the truth. And John here in Second John is telling us how to handle our daily lives based on two things, truth and love. But today, we'll be studying with the truth. So, first thing that we can see here in regarding the truth and the believers is that the truth unites believers. The truth unites believers. That's what we can see in the first verse where it says there, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. You can see here that there is unity between the elder who wrote the letter and those who know the truth. They are in unity with the elect lady and her children. So there is unity that we can see that they are all in harmony. But before going there, in this world, we can see is getting to a more hostile world. In fact, it is divided that the only thing that can unify this is the power of the gospel. Now, this is actually what we can see when the Lord Jesus Christ prayed 
in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. It says there, neither, neither pray I for this alone, meaning those who were believers with him, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So these believers that he uh, witnessed during his earthly ministry, this he expected them to share the gospel. And in turn, this, those who accepted the gospel and received the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord, these are the people that he's praying for, that they will be together. And verse 21, this is his prayer, that, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now you can see here, that the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer is for the unity of the believers. And you can see that this is a clear picture. This unity can be achieved only if the relationship between the Father and the Son is assimilated and copied by the believers. Now, this petition of the Lord Jesus Christ, I can see that the oneness of the community is predicated on the relationship of the believers with the Godhead. We can only be united if we have the relationship with the Godhead. Now, going directly now, going back to Second John verse 1, what are the ingredients or what do we mean by the truth unites believers? Number one, you can see here that there should be an acceptance of the truth. There should be an acceptance of the truth. Now, verse 1 tells us the author of the epistle or the letter. It says there, the elder. That word elder means a mature person person who is uh, advanced in years. That's the literal meaning. But here we can see that this John, this, there, there's the, 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 this word uh, letter, uh, elder, refers none other than to John. It is without any uh, doubt that the author of this epistle is none other than John. He is John the Beloved. Now, why didn't he use the, his office and assert his office as an apostle? Why? Because you can see in using the title, The Elder, he is manifesting his paternal love to those who, uh, to the audience that he's writing to. So this is making sure that they are comfortable with him as a father. Now, he had no need to assert his apostleship. Why? Because at this point in time, when he wrote this letter, you will know that he is the only living apostle. Now, this letter was uh, approximately written around uh, 90 AD. So, he is the only living apostle, and everybody knows that he is the eldest in, in uh, uh, relative to the Christian faith. So, Nobody can question his standing before the community. He, he said, the elder. Now, if you will go to 1 Peter uh, 5.1, it says there, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. You will see here that Peter calls himself a partaker, meaning uh, he is a participant of the glory that shall be revealed. Why? Because elders are those, in this case, the Peter and John, they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So there, John is writing as an elder with the implication that as he did before, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, believed the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, you will note that this is also the testimony of Peter. Now, that is the author of the letter. Now, the recipient. 
a recipient. You can see here that the recipient that we can see here is the elect lady. Now, there's uh, a lot of ways that the readers of the Bible interpreted this lady. One, uh, one probability that they said that elect lady pertains to a woman in uh, Babel, a Babylonian woman who is called Electa, and this is the person that uh, the Apostle John wrote to. Now, some other say, I don't know where they got this, but the elect lady here pertains to Kyria. And again, I don't know the veracity of that one. Now, elect lady here said that this is a courteous, ad uh, courteous address to an individual unknown lady, unnamed by the Apostle John. So, um, that's what we can see here. The third probability is that some people are saying that this elect lady pertains to the church at, at large. But I don't believe this interpretation because in verse 13, you will see uh, John, uh, Second John 13, you will see that there is another, uh, there's a sister to this elect lady. So it's not the universal church. Uh, the, the last probability that we can see here is that this elect lady represents the church and his children are the members of this church. Now, uh, most scholars lean towards this interpretation that this elect lady, uh, John addressed this to a local church. But there's also uh, one school of thought that are saying that elect lady here pertains to a particular lady. Now, these two interpretations, a local church or an elect lady and his children, would not actually, um, would not make any difference in the interpretation of the entire letter. Meaning we can take both as uh, the audience of this letter. Now, what can we see? The first thing that we can see about the, the, the lady is that he is described as an elect lady, which means elect is chosen. What we can see here from this principle is that this indicates that the election, her election, was initiated by God. And she is in her privileged position. It's not accidental. This is also true for all of us. As believers, we were all elected. In fact, you can see in the Bible that we did not choose God. And we have no way, when, during our uh, unbelieving times, when we were not yet saved, there is no way that we will seek God. But God made the initiative in order for us to get saved. So what we can gather here is that the spiritual status of every believer enjoy is, we can enjoy it because of the result of God's grace and goodness. There's no other way that we can become believers and we are enjoying the status of believers except for the grace of God. And that our initial state, our initial terms of our covenant, they were initiated by God. And then even our ongoing life in serving God, our part of the covenant, we are able to do this because God enabled us to do this by His grace. And finally, even the fulfillment of His promises to us as believers, these are all accomplished by God's grace. You see, nothing in this life, as believers, nothing in this life is initiated by us. If there is anything that comes from our will, from our human wisdom, these are not acceptable to God. The only thing that is acceptable to God are the things that He 
initiated to us and we in turn accept them from God by grace and leave them. So, first thing that you can see here is the acceptance of the truth. The elder, John, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the truth, and the elect lady was saved because he, she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as, his, as her personal Savior as well. So, if there can be any unity in this, is that they both, they both parties in this letter, all accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The first ingredient, how the truth can unite us, is the acceptance of the truth. Acceptance of the gospel the truth. Secondly, we can see here is that aside from accepting the truth, you will need also to be in agreement with the truth. Now, the elder uh, that we can see here in First John, uh, Second John, verse one, he he possess the authority and leadership by virtue of his character, meaning he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and lived his life based on his teachings and the teachings of God that was revealed to him. Every truth that he received, every information, every commandment that he received from God, he lived according to those parameters. That is why he can have the authority and the leadership because of his character, integrity, and moral standing. The elder was live a life that is an example to those who are now believers and are starting to live their life according to the spiritual commandment of God. That's what you can see, that he can be, the elder can be a spiritual example. First Peter 5.3, it says there, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. So, he is an example of how to make his life agreeable and in harmony with the Word of God. And he, the elder, saw the same thing in the elect lady in the way she lived and the way that her children live. That is why they all not only accepted the truth, but also they are in agreement with that truth. That is why they have unity. Third thing that we can see regarding how truth unites believers is the appreciation of the truth. Appreciation of the truth. Going back to Second Peter verse 1, it says there, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, whom I love in the truth. That word, I dare, is empathic. He is giving, underscoring that he, whom I, myself, that's what, uh, in effect, what he's saying, whom I, myself, love constantly. Now, John has loved the elect lady and her children based on his sincere appreciation and high regard for them. So that's why he said here, whom I love in the truth. Now, in effect, what he's saying here is that John may love other people, but he appreciates and gives great esteem to the elect lady and her children because his love, they can saw, he saw the way they live. And therefore, he was very appreciative of how they are conducting their lives. And he valued the truth so much so that whenever he sees anyone applies the truth of God's word, then he is very appreciative. This he exhibited and if you can see also, you will also know that this is not only true for him. 
but also true for other people as mentioned in the, uh, the rest of the part of ver uh, the first verse. So, he said here that I, myself, John, love you in the truth. Now, this love is being limited by the prepositional phrase in the truth. What does it mean? That he doesn't love randomly. That this love is not uh, motivated, it's not uh, put upon him randomly. He loved this elect lady and her children because he saw the truth applied in their lives. What's what we can see is that he appreciates the truth. So how can truth unite us? You will know that we also need appreciation for what the truth is and how they affect our lives. Right now, a lot of people are in disagreement because they don't know what truth is there to hold on to. Some people have their own opinion and others create their own opinion. To the point that nobody is in agreement because nobody knows what the truth is. And in this episode, the Apostle John is asserting that the truth that we need is the truth of the Word of God. Now, continuing with that, is that when he mentioned, the Apostle John mentioned, the elder mentioned to the elect lady that he loved them, he's saying, in effect, that I might be saying some things that will hurt you, but in the end, you will know that this I did because of my love. Therefore, whatever negative things he will say, they will be acceptable to the elect lady and her children because this is because of his love for them. Love in the truth indicates the elder and his leader are in the truth, meaning they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are, agreement, they are in agreement that this is the number one thing that they need to follow in their lives. And then whenever, the third thing is that they appreciate those who are also living in the truth. Now, we can see here that the elect lady was loved by the apostle John and his love to them is based on the truth. The absence of truth makes love untrue. Now, the, in the absence of truth, there will be no true love in the absence of truth. Now, 1 John 3.18, it says, there, My little children, let us not love in the word. Meaning, let us not just say that we love and then continuing neither in tongue let us not just say this in words let us not just say it and then think that we can accomplish we can show this love by just words continuing with the says that but indeed and in truth meaning love is not just shown by our communication in words but more specially, more true, that we can only show our love by action and work. The last ingredient that the truth unites us is the apprehension of the truth. So we see that there should be acceptance of the truth, there should be agreement with the truth, and then there should be appreciation of the truth, which means which truth are we following. And then lastly, we need to have apprehension of the truth. Apprehension by apprehension here, we mean there should be an understanding of the truth. Second John, the last part there, he said there, Apostle John said, I love you, the elect lady, but he also said in the last part, that, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. And also they that have known the truth. So he's saying that, He's not the only one who appreciates this, uh, this 
the way that the elect lady and her children are living, but also they who have known the truth. That word know there means uh, to know experientially. In fact, the tense of that uh, participle there, that word known, is in perfect tense, meaning that they have known the truth before and this truth is now governing their life, that this, they haven't abandoned that truth and they are living by their own experience right now in the same truth that they have known before. And now, these people who have the truth and are living in the truth are also appreciating what the elect lady is doing and her children. In effect, what, is, what we can see here is that the only way that we can be united in the truth is by understanding, apprehension, and living, capturing that understanding and living our lives accordingly to the truth. Second Thessalonians 2.13 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says there, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The main verb there is that it said we are bound. That word bound means it is now our obligation, it is our moral and legal obligation to thank God. Why? Because he, in this, Apostle Paul, is seeing in the Thessalonians that their lives is sanctified, meaning they are dedicated in living their lives according to the truth of the gospel. Galatians 5 to 5, it says there, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. That word continue means to persist. Meaning it is not enough that we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and live the word lie. When we apprehend the truth of the gospel, we accepted the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, Him as our personal Savior and Lord, and based on this, our life has changed, and now it is patterned and governed by the truth that is in us. Therefore, in this first verse, we can see that the truth unites believers. How? If they accept the Lord Jesus Christ and that they are in agreement with the standard that they are going to have and that they appreciate everyone that lives according to the truth and finally we can understand the truth, then we can be united. This is true not only in the church, but in this case as you can see, if this is an elect lady and her children, then you will note that this is also true in the family. A lot, of, uh, a lot of analysts are saying that what is happening right now to our society, the chaos, the disunity, is because there is lacking character. Why? Because there, our families right now are broken. But in order for us to unite, we must unite in character. And we can only be in unity if we are living in the truth. In this case, John, the elect lady and her children, and the others who have known the truth, they have only one common denominator, and that is the truth. So, they practice their faith, they have known it ever since, and they love each other. Why? Because of the truth. So, the next point here that we can see is that 
in 2 John verse 2. 2 John verse 2. And it says there, For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Now, we can see first that the truth unites believers. Now we can see here in verse 2 that the truth indwells believers. The truth indwells believers. Now, you can see here the first uh, clause that you can see is for the truth's sake, which means that when we say that the truth indwells the believers, number one thing that we can see in that person is that there is commitment to the truth. The first verse, continuing with the second verse, in the first part of the second verse, John is saying that this he did, everything that he did, the appreciation, the, everything that he did is for the truth's sake. The love that he has for the elect lady and even those who have known the gospel, the love that he has for them is for the sake of the word of God, commitment to the truth. This same sentiment is given to us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.23. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23, and it says there, it says, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Apostle Paul mentioned about the things that happened to him, the things that he suffered. Why did he allow himself to be experiencing all this negative part of his life? Negative in the sense that it's hurting, that he is suffering, that these are all can be viewed as adversities in his life. Why did he accept all those things? He said here, it is for the gospel's sake. It's like, why? Because he said that I might be partaker. Now, that word partaker came from the Greek word synkoinoinos. Uh, Two words, sin means with, koinonia means fellowship. Now, in effect, what he's saying here is that, that I might share with you the things, the gospel's benefit, that I can share with you and be with you in the appreciation of the gospel. Meaning, the Apostle Paul is saying here that all those things that happened to me, they're nothing. Why? Because I am doing this for the gospel's sake. When the truth is living in us, is occupying our heart, then we will be committed to that truth. In fact, this is what God said in Psalm 51.6, God is saying here in God, in Psalm 51.6, He says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God is saying here in this verse is that God desires truth in the heart, in the inward parts, which means that The truth is so embedded in our lives that we are committed to live according to that truth. We cannot only know the truth, but we can love in the truth and live for the truth's sake. So, what John did here is that he was concerned with the elect lady because the background of this uh, episode is that there are false teachers roaming around, getting into churches, getting into families, and giving them wrong doctrines. And the Apostle John was concerned that the elect lady, because he is, uh, she is a believer and her children, that they will entertain these false teachers 
and love them. And what he's saying then here is that she should not compromise her truth just to entertain these false teachers. In effect, John is saying that the elect lady should not compromise truth because she should be governed by the truth. Her hospitality should be limited by the truth. Believers cannot genuinely manifest their love apart from the unswerving commitment to the truth. There is no relationship unless there is a commitment, uncompromising, unswerving commitment to the truth. The truth should permeate in all aspects of our lives, not only in the church, but in our personal lives, in our personal relationship. I've ex experienced this, that uh, without truth, there will be disaster. This is true not only, again, in any organization, but in any relationship, and especially in marriage, in family. Uh, it's a common cliche that we can see that uh, love is blind, that love is blind. This should not be the case. Our love should be governed by truth. And if we are just, uh, if we are just turning away our eyes from the truth when we are in love and we are, are engaged in our emotion without using our, we're just using our, our hearts without using our mind, then that will be disaster because true love can only be manifested with the truth. So, the first thing that we can see when the truth involves in us, we have commitment to the truth. Secondly, we have communion with the truth. That's why we can see there, which dwelleth in us. The truth dwelt in us. And if you still remember, uh, just at the top of my head, John 14, 6, where in the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you will also see that Apostle John mentioned that the Lord Jesus Christ lives within us. And this is true not only for him, but also for God the Father and the Holy Spirit. We will see here that in this particular verse, the truth here pertains to, in, in 2 John 2, 2, the particular truth here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He indwells us. He is occupying our hearts. When we accept that the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, He is living in our hearts. But when you are an unbeliever, this is not true. This is only true for believers. So, in writing this episode, John is saying that he is committed to the truth. That truth mattered to John and that if ever there is deception and error would slip into the fellowship of the church, in the fellowship of the elect lady and his and her family, you will know that this will result in tragedy and devastation. That is why there should not only be a commitment to the truth, but also that we are in communion with the truth living in us. As I mentioned earlier, the Lord Jesus Christ lives in our heart, but it doesn't necessarily Go down. It doesn't necessarily mean that he is governing our lives. Sometimes, instead of allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to rule our hearts, sometimes we dethrone him from his throne in our hearts 
and place ourselves in that throne. What this means is that we, instead of being submissive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and the truth that is given to us, instead of living in that life, we would rather live according to how we want and how we uh, desire things. The throne in God. It's not saying, I'm not saying that the Lord Jesus Christ will leave our hearts. What I'm saying is that sometimes we allow ourselves to have the preeminence in our hearts instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can never fully understand the truth. But in this case, if we are to live our lives, based on God's will, and I mean, we, based on God's will and plan for our lives, we need to commune with God. We need to put Him in the throne and submit to His leading. Indwelling of the truth means, it doesn't mean that we will understand everything there is to understand in God's Word. Because as you can see, the vastness that we can learn from the scriptures, we cannot completely understand the Bible in our lifetime. But the truth that are necessary for our lives, we can only see them. These are revealed to us, the truth necessary, the truth that will save us. And we can know that in confidence is through the truth revealed to us in God. And finally, in this section, is that you can see in 1 John, 20, 1 John 2, 20 and 21, it says there, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you, because ye have known the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. The Holy Spirit will guide us the things that we need to learn and the things that would uh, give us confidence. And actually, that is the third, uh, the third part of the truth in those believers, and that is confidence in the truth. We are only not have commitment to the truth. We also have communion with the truth. And finally, we have confidence in the truth. You can see that even there uh, in... Second John, verse 2, it says, And shall be with us forever. And shall be with us forever. So it says, going back to the uh, previous one, in, in John fifteen seven, it says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Meaning, if we have the communion with the truth, then we will be living a life that will be dependent on God and His Word, and we will ask God. And then, because this, we will have the confidence. In fact, this is the promise that we can see in the last part of Second John, John, oh, Second John, chapter two. It says, "And shall be with us forever." In that verse two, and the truth lives in us, and shall be with us forever. This is assurance of salvation. This means that believing is not just a mere assent to a body of doctrine. That is important, but believers' life should be controlled by the love for the truth and desire to magnify the truth. It's not enough that we agree with the truth, but we have to live in that truth. First Peter 1, 23 and 25 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, 
but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The truth indwells us. Why? This means that we have commitment. We need commitment to the truth. We have to be in constant communion with the truth. And because of this, this will produce confidence in the truth. So the next uh, studies on this verse 1 will be seen uh, in the next session. Thank you for your faithfulness and God bless.